Chef Mark with Escafe Online International Culinary Academy. Welcome to our live webcast we do each week and to our internationally acclaimed network of cooks and chefs. So we're glad to have you here today. Uh, it's fun to have you and we want you to participate in a big way in this session as we do each week. You can chat, ask questions and we're happy to take those questions from you and to help you improve your knowledge about cooking whether you are a home cook or home chef, food enthusiast, foodie, or maybe a future culinary professional in our, in our industry. We're happy to take your questions and to um, you know, answer them as best we can. Today particularly we're doing beef and it's London broil. And that is because at this time of year it's time to get the grill out, the barbecue grill, or end of the broiler ready in your oven and cook some great meat. Also, we're in that part of the progression in our curriculum where we're doing beef. So today happens to be London broil, and then next week will be old-fashioned beef stew. I'll tell you more about that later on. But for today, we're going to talk about beef, what cuts you'd want to use for London broil, what cuts you can use, and what some people do use. So thanks for being here with us. Feel free to chat, type in. We're glad to take your questions because we're here for you to improve your knowledge. So let's start with talking about London broil and what cuts of meat are used. Usually a London broil is a piece of meat looks like a London broil. It's a relatively thick, long cut of meat, many times cut from the top round, and this in fact is cut from the top round. Now, some people may use flank steak, but that's not really a London broil. You need a thicker cut of meat. I prefer one to two inches. Actually, this is a bit thin. It's what the store had nearby my home. Two stores, they went. It's a bit thin. You want at least one inch. It's three quarters of an inch. It should work. Just to be mindful when you broil it. It cooks quickly. Two inches would be ideal for London broil. So you get a nice thick slice and it cooks properly. It doesn't cook very fast, and we'll just be careful when we put it into our broiler in our oven. You would put the broiler on high. So a top round, I'm looking at this, this cut of top round. It'll, it'll say top round London broil on it. And knowing the confirmation of beef as I do, being a chef all those years and having done some meat cutting, early on in my career, this is a vertical cut from a top round. So this is actually the entire um, width of the top round. And knowing that these have a somewhat triangular shape, this must have weighed 24 to 28 pound top or inside round. You're saying, well, what's a top or inside round? I want to sanitize my hands for a few moments. You say, what's the top or inside round? Well. It comes from the round, which is the haunch or entire leg of beef cattle, right? So that's the top round. The top round, or what we call in meat cutting butcher's parlance, the inside round. It's on the top when you select and cut the top round. When you lay it flat, the, it, it's on top and we call it the top round. As the cattle walks, it's actually inside the, behind the flank area. So that's good to use for a number of things. So use it for brochette meat, it has to be marinated. Top round you'll see many times carved as roast beef in, in restaurants, family bean restaurants. And of course top round is now used for London broil. But if you can get them to cut it an inch or two inches thick, that'd be even better yet. The other cut of meat that I have here is the um, sirloin tip. All right, the sirloin tip. The sirloin tip is underneath where the bottom sirloin is. The top and bottom sirloin is the top and bottom round. So the top sirloin makes some great steaks, and the bottom sirloin also makes some great steaks, but mostly it makes great roasts. You can make some steaks from the top sirloin, small steaks that you can grill, but be mindful using top sirloin is cheaper than a short loin, which is the tenderloin and the uh, New York. Be mindful of cooking the top sirloin you can't cook the beyond medium rare because there isn't a whole lot of marbling and they get a little chewy. So 
you want to use a top sirloin to cook for a steak, you want to grill it, broil it, barbecue it, be mindful, over medium, it's dry. Of course, the best steaks, as you know, are from the short loin, strip loin, right? New York strip, boneless strip loin. Kansas City steak, bone in, from the, the strip loin itself. So today we're working with the top round, or the inside round, top and bottom round. And we're working with the bottom sirloin, what they call a tri-tip. Just so you know where the, the difference is with the top or inside round, that was 5.19 a pound. And the less known cut of meat, the sirloin tip, 4.19 a pound, a whole dollar cheaper. So you keep that in mind, perhaps, when, you, when you going, you're going to marinate them anyway on London broil, because you have to, because they're from either the sirloin tip or the round. Not a whole lot of marbling, not tender. The round, the whole leg and part of the sirloin tip kind of moves the animal, so there's, there's more, it's more, um, it's tougher. But for a dollar or less, you can buy the sirloin tip steak, but it's uneven, right? That would burn and that would be raw, so I butterflied it. What I did was, bought the sirloin tip, it says sirloin tip roast, you can roast that, but it's better yet, and I just laid it flat, and I just, you know, cut it and pounded it out. So I'm going to marinate that as well. This will this will make a very nice wider slice, nice and rare, Mar marinated, tenderized overnight. Keep in mind, it'll make a I'll give you a very nice slice. As opposed to London broil, that's a little short, give us a little shorter slices. It's just an appearance thing. And I guess chefs know we, we, uh, we seek perfec perfection, but we'll take excellence any day of the week, right? So there's a dollar less. You won't be able to cook, well, I guess you can, but if you want to cook London broil and a sirloin tip medium, medium well, not the most platable or moist product in the world. So usually with London broil, the tri-tip, sirloin tip roast that you're going to broil. It's got to be medium rare. Otherwise, it'll be very dry. There's no intramuscular fat to hydrolyze to give you that nice flavor you get from a grilled steak. Someone asked, why does the meat look so dark? The top round. I'm glad you asked that question because last night it was this color. And then when I put the marinade over it, it absorbed the color and changed it. So that's why. It was in a marinade overnight. So I like to use this Cardini's balsamic vinaigrette. And you can use a French dressing, but um, it's nice and easy. You can make your own vinaigrette dressing, which is just oil and vinegar, three parts oil, one part of vinegar, some fresh spices of your choice or dried spices, a little sugar, maybe a little molasses, or honey and some salt, make your own marinade, but it's not easy to buy in the bottle. I just put my favorite marinade or dressing, it's a salad dressing, Cordini's uh, balsamic vinaigrette. And then, uh, or you can put it in a Ziploc bag, but I, I like to put it in the bowl and then, you know, I wake up three in the morning and I turn it over. Actually, I don't. But, uh, I'm just saying that, but you marinate it overnight and then you let it, it's gonna absorb the flavor no, it's not going to tenderize. Marinades, marinades, the D, will give great flavor. It makes up for the lack of moistness because there's no intramuscular fat, right? Also known as marbling. But if you add a little more vinegar or sometimes a little more lemon juice, if it's really thick, and I noticed it was chewy the last time, and some of my Midwestern friends like it medium to well done, I'll put some lemon juice in there to tenderize it somewhat. The best amount of time is right around 6 p.m. You finish making dinner, put it in the marinade, 24 hours, works great. At least eight, right? But 24, it permeates. You can see it almost, with the vinegar, it tends to, it tends to cure it. And it smells great when you grill, it gives it a little flavor, but a marinade um, is not gonna penetrate. 
bit more lemon juice. It would also don't take a fork like they say and oh you gotta stab the meat and put lots of holes in it. Can you bake it now? Because if you put holes <laughs> you put holes in it, well all the flavor that's inside will come out. That's only fine if you're gonna use this for a Swiss steak. The Swissing process. That's when the steak is put through one of those needle machines. You can even buy the jacare. You jab it and cut them into three or four ounce pieces. So you don't want to puncture. Say, oh, puncture the, don't be puncturing your meat. All the flavor that's inside will be exuded. You don't want that. What if you're going to do, if you're going to braise, well, this makes a great braise, great Swiss steak. And um, that's important to keep in mind. Do you want to bake a London broil? No. Uh, um, you want to uh, broil or grill a London broil. An interesting point, point about a London broil, so it is broiled. So if you went to London, you wouldn't find it. It's not known in London. Uh, I guess it's like French toast. You don't find French toast in France. Americans go, where's the French toast? Well, that, that's an American thing. Same with London broil. It's an American dish we really love to make. And, um, you can use the flank, yeah, flank steak. Some people say, well, I can use the flank steak. That's not really a London broil. You got to use the top or a sirloin tip or a bottom round. Now, be careful buying bottom round for a London broil. It's even drier or chewier yet. The bottom round is best for marinating for stew, beef bourguignon or beef stew that we're doing next week. Also, the bottom round is fine to make Swiss steaks or braised steaks, sour, rotten. It needs moist heat. None of the... Uh, None of the musculature in the chuck or the round get dry cooked because they're, they're, there's no intramuscular fat. The only roasting or bacon or grilling would be the rib and short loin. Of course, the tenderloin, right? We all like that. Tenderloin doesn't have a whole lot of flavor. It's very tender. Many times you will find the New York strip, Kansas City strip, or the rib to have more flavor, hence more fat. But tenderloin is very tender for that and easy to eat. Of course, the more flavorful meats are, are here. The chuck, right, and brisket, the rib, prime rib, the short plate or the short ribs, flank steak, like the vieja ropas or fajitas is with the flank or the skirt steak. What is the best way to keep the meat from becoming dry? Someone asked, what's the best way to prevent the meat from becoming dry. Don't be uh, tweeting and doing your internet and cooking at the same time. Because if you do those three things at the same time, <laughs> it's gonna be dry, which means you have to pay attention when you cook. And that's what we're gonna do very soon. We're gonna put this on a broiler and I'm gonna tell you about how to broil the meat. So you wanna focus on cooking one thing at a time. Um, an acquaintance of mine said he always had trouble with his pork chops. I said, what was going on? Well, the, I'm putting the kids in the high chair and I'm on the phone. I'm, the dog's running around feeding the dog. And I said, well, no wonder your pork chops were dry. You weren't paying attention. So uh, you got to pay attention when you're cooking to avoid uh, your food from being dry. Or better yet, if you have more money, buy yourself a, a, a ribeye steak. <laughs> they don't get dry unless you want to cook them. So just to recap, the meat you want to use for lamb broil, preferably a little thicker, an inch to two inches if you can get it cut by a butcher, imagine that, and uh, marinated for great flavor. Uh, you know, pick your favorite dressing to put in there. Uh, you can put garlic powder, onion powder, and then have a hot broiler in your oven. You want to have the broiler or the rack about three inches from the heat element, depending on the thickness of the meat. Maybe sometimes it's four inches, you have to adjust that. It's a little bit of an art, right? Because some ovens have that coil for the broiler. It might work okay. Some ovens have a really uh, cir thorough circuit of element that really broils. So you gotta, you gotta test it out. You wanna test it out with a slice of bread, see how quick it browns bread, and you adjust the rack of your oven so that you don't, you don't burn it. So I'm gonna marinate that. I have my sirloin tip marinated. I marinate this overnight, and um, it's ready to put under our broiler. So what does a broiler mean? Broiler means top heat, right? Coming down from the top. Though now these restaurants the last 10 years have a 
have the vertical broilers, and they put the steak in. It sears on both sides. I think wildfire is one of the ones. You need really high heat to really get a, a steak. With these, high heat is good too, because it keeps the it keeps the moisture in. So low heat would be a bad thing. You wouldn't want to bake it or put it on very low heat. It'll steam before it cooks. A little caramelization on the exterior. Also be mindful, a lot of these have high fructose corn syrup and the sugar, they, it might burn it, so just be careful. You know, do a test run before you have friends and relatives over in your driveway or in your backyard for barbecue. Do you recommend a fried choice or select kind of meat? We're going to walk over to our broiler now and broil our meat. So if someone asked the question, do we prefer USDA prime choice or select meat? Uh, this is USDA choice. So at least you can buy that. And I see, uh, and the choice has some inc incidence of intramuscular fat, intramuscular fat, some incidence. But, so that's what we would call marbling, these small specks of fat that is marbling but in the top round is tougher so you for a broil sure if you want to buy the uca prime linen broil you'll get more fat that hydrolyzes when it cooks and gives it moistness you'll probably pay double i paid 519 for this uca choice i've looked at the prime it's usually 8 or 919 london broil so much for a cheap cut of meat right uh, i saw recently the uh, USDA Prime uh, ribeye steak, beautiful. More incidence of marbling. The fat's a little more yellow color than it should be. Uh, it looked beautiful. Ooh, it's like 18, 19, uh, $17 a pound for USDA Choice. You better cook that right. And if your friends only like well done meat, don't be buying choice on them. You'll waste it on them, all right? So that's the chef's tips for today. So certainly in uh, Chef August Escoffier's day, London broil wasn't known, though he opened up the Ritz-Carlton, right? The, the British liked to broil meat, so I think, no doubt, an American chef came up on the idea of a London broil, because the British liked their meat broiled uh, or roasted, right? That's a British tradition. So I had my grill. I uh, took the meat out of the marinade, had it perfectly dry, and I wanted room temperature. I don't mean in the room for four hours, but I wanted to sit at least an hour because meat that is not chilled cooks better. Get the degree of doneness you want if you let the meat sit at room temperature. So I, I took the marinade off, had to dry with paper towels. I'm going to brush just a little, a little oil on there. It gives a little sheen. It won't stick to my grill, right? or the grill bars on my broiler. And then I tasted the, the Cardini's dressing. It needed a little more salt. So don't be afraid to salt a little less for a marinated piece of meat on both sides. Sea salt, I do use sea salt. That's looking good. What else can I say about that? So it's room temperature, perfectly dry. The marinade, a little oil. Set the grill on high. Oh, if you're going to be home, you're going to want to put this on a rack, a cookie rack, on your sheet pan. If you don't have a cookie rack, just a half a sheet pan is fine. Okay? So here's my broiler. A broiler is always top heat. This is actually an angled broiler, somewhat angled. But I got the, the uh, rungs or tines nice and hot. I brushed it earlier, right? Turned the broiler on, got it hot. Same at home with your grill. Turn it on, get it on, on high, burn off, scrape off the carbon, right? Then you'll want to oil it. Because there's always some carbon, see, still on there from all those other steaks. And then you get a little fiber in your diet, it's very good for you. So we'll let that burn off. And that looked pretty good. So
So we'll bring our steak over. Just brush off that little extra fiber on there. Lower it down. And then I know how this broiler works. The element, the element is um, low and high, so I gotta put it about there. So it's about, about four inches or so from the heat element. Oh, and don't worry about grill marks. Uh, that's not important, the, the, you know, the crosshatch mark on your steak. That was uh, some food journalist, food stylist idea some years ago. The steak has to have this crosshatch mark. Well, two things wrong with that is the crosshatch parts are burnt and the other ones are raw. So you want it to cook even and that's important. Don't worry about the grill marks unless you're in some competition where they want that. We prefer that the, the, the meat be cooked evenly, nice brown color overall, and be nice and moist and flavorful. <coughs> Someone asked me why I use sea salt. Well, it's from the sea and there's nothing else in it. Uh, table salt has sodium silicate. Table salt has some anti-caking chemical and a very chemical. Enough chemicals already, right? Sea salt just has one ingredient, uh, sea salt. So I kind of like that. And I use the fine because the fine salt, you know, distributes evenly. You have the coarse salt, you're going to have big pieces of salt on it. I know some, some restaurant chefs like to crack coarse sea salt on their food before it goes out. But um, the coarse sea salt is nice with caramel or chocolate, right? I like to use the the fine sea salt, so it dissolves. I can see it, but it dissolves on my meat. You notice I didn't pepper this, if you notice. I didn't pepper it. Some chefs will pepper their meat. They'll put some black pepper, freshly ground black pepper is wonderful. You may buy the Telecherry peppercorn, which is great from Southwest India, the best. And uh, for me, uh, the, the moisture and the oil and the salt dissolve into the meat. But the pepper, since it's the dried berry of an evergreen bush, is going to burn. So I don't put pepper on my poultry or my meat until after it's cooked. And that's the original use of pepper. Pepper was used to, to prevent um, or to mask meat as a little rancid. So I don't like it burnt or acrid. I like to put it on after so I can have a nice smoky taste. Oh, uh, if you have, if you have a, your broiler should be on high and um, 425, 450 if you have a broiler adjustment that has the temperature. Of course, in the restaurants, you just put it on high and you go for it. So if I'm, I'm cooking a lot of them or I'm doing something else, I may reduce it down to watch it. So let's take a look at it. So with this broiler, it browns on one side on the other. So I want to turn it around. and put that back on there, back up top. And now I'm gonna bring, and I'm gonna bring the meat over now and show you how we carve it, since it's done. Okay, so here's our meat we broiled up. And some of those juices, you want it to rest. So I have a question. What are your thoughts on the belief that salt has a tendency to dry out meat during the cooking process because it absorbs the natural juices? Uh, great question, as they all are. Someone asked my belief on salt uh, being used as it tends to dry out the natural juices of food. It sure does. So you need to salt food just before you're going to cook it. That's important. You wouldn't want to salt an hour before because it, uh, it will start to draw moisture from the surface of the meat. So it's important that when you salt raw meat, uh, it, can, it should be somewhat moist. 
and then you, you sprinkle liberally the, the salt over the top. And since it's wet, the salt dissolves and goes into the meat, gives it a flavor. So yeah, you don't want a good observation. You don't want to salt the meat 20 minutes, half hour early because it will pull out moisture. And that's not what we want to have. We want to have good flavor. So a uh, good tip and very important to realize that. That's a great question. All right, so we broiled this uh, four minutes on each side. This was four minutes on one side, four minutes on the other, so a total of eight minutes. I think this was about nine minutes. Time goes by fast when you're having fun, right? So as you can see, I let it rest, and I want some of those juices because one of the greatest um, steak sauces you could use is melted butter and the juices from the broiled meat and some Worcestershire sauce. And that, let me tell you, is the best steak sauce to put, on, to put right on the meat. You can put a little more uh, Worcestershire sauce if you like. But So, did I answer that question? I think I did. Okay, good. So we let it rest. Why is it important to rest? So that all the exterior heat works from the outside in. I'm sorry, that's a microwave. All the heat works, yeah, from the outside in. Microwave is inside out, right? So you want to have the heat, and as it cooks, it finally the heat penetrates the center, and all the blood goes to the center. If I would cut that, any roast beef, or a steak right after, you know, the juice is run out. So let it rest at least a minute or two. So you're, by the time your guest gets the ribeye, it'll be it'll be uh, rest, and then it gives a nice a nice pink color. So this is in this is the medium rare medium stage. This was 120 degrees when I took it out of the broiler. So have a have a thermometer to check, and then also you can use the pad of your hand thumb, index finger, rare, thumb, middle finger, medium rare, medium rare to medium. So the same pressure. Let it rest and you can carve it nice and thin. Nice thin slices because remember, this is not, you're not carving a ribeye. You're not carving a, a Kansas City strip, which is the bone in. Oh, that's so beautiful. And I know you say, oh, I didn't like my meat well done. Well, you cook on a broil well done, and then you call me up and tell me how it came out. It'll be a bit chewy, I can tell you. So uh, there's some nice slices. And let's rearrange those on the plate for you. So you want a nice long, you said long, bias cut. Yeah, uh, the question is, is it important to cut meat on an angle? It is. The, the only reason being, it's not like when you cut sushi, you can cut it straight down, it wouldn't look too big. But when they cut it on an angle, you get this big slice. Wow, a lot of fish. So same idea, idea here. We can cut it like that. But we're not getting anywhere. What a skimpy piece that is. So that we, and then, of course, you know, presentation is everything, right? So... Uh, they probably weigh the same, but which one do you want on your plate, right? How long would you cook it for for it to be well done but still tender at the same time? Well, someone said, how do you... How long would you, how long would you cook the London broil if you wanted it to be well done and tender at the same time, right? Well, those are mutually exclusive Links. It can happen. If you cook it well done, it won't be tender. Um, it'll be well done, and it'll be tough and chewy and somewhat dry. You can cook a ribeye well done. You can cook a prime rib well done, right? Remember, uh, you'll see many restaurants stand on the bottom of the menu. The manager is not responsible for the tenderness or moistness of steaks cooked beyond medium. And they stay, stay there in the joiner because people will say, why well, don't we like well done steak? And they send it back, say it's dry. Yes. 
it will be dry uh, um, and chewy, uh, especially a London broil or the sirloin tip. I think this needs a little more of that, what's this here, sauce in there to make it. That is the most wonderful, um, wonderful flavor is Worcestershire and butter and the, and the drippings, the juice from the meat, I'm telling you. It beats any steak sauce. Try it. Now, what's next with this? So uh, we'll take more meat questions, but we have to do some red wine now. Because if you're going to have a nice piece of meat, like that London broil, the way we prepared it today, you want to have some wine. And we'll drink any wine before it's time. That's our motto. So what I have here is uh, Francis Ford Coppola Merlot. It's a California Merlot from a number of vineyards throughout the state. As you know, the Coppola family, or Francis Ford Coppola, purchased the Inglenook Winery in the late 70s, I recall. And it was a jug wine company. And of course, now he has his own brand, as you can see. And I like to have a Merlot with um, London broil or any kind of steak, because it's light enough. Cabs can be a bit rich, right, a bit tannic, the cabs. So I like to have a Merlot since the Merlot a little more soft, a little more approachable. The, the, the bouquet is, is spectacular coming out of that bottle. You waving at me? Is that a question? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, what would you use for size for this beautiful piece of meat here? Someone asked, what size for that? Well, we'd have a London broil. You might as well have some nice potato salad with that. That would be great. And uh, even uh, coleslaw would be nice. Many times I serve uh, pump puree, mashed potatoes, the great uh, Chef Escafé recipe for pum puree, which we've done before. That is nice with this too. Um, I'm not a fan of vegetables, so I'll probably just have beef and, uh, and potatoes. But um, that's what you want to see, the glistening, the moistness, and the nice color. No one wants it raw. Some people like it raw, but the same thing with the London Braille. If it's raw, well done, same issue applies. It's so raw, you can't chew, it's like rubber. It's well done, it's very dry, and you have trouble chewing it as well. Keep in mind, our, our, our systems tend to be carnivore, so eating meat that is not as well done, we're easier to digest that than well done meat. Yeah, medium red meat is easier digested. What are the portions of butter, produce, and Worcestershire sauce to make the... Uh... Uh, someone the recipe for the steak sauce, Scoffier steak sauce. Uh, I have a quarter pound of butter, I put in two tablespoons of Worcestershire sauce and all the juice I could render from the, uh, the, broiled, from the, uh, the broiled meat. And uh, I may put a little more Worcestershire in there. It looks just a little too much butter. But uh, nothing beats, uh, you know, when you, when you get to roast the meat, the foam, as we call it, and the juice gives a great flavor. Someone asked you to put wine in the steak sauce. Actually, no, you put wine in the glass, and that's what we're going to do now. Only fill the glass about a third full. That way you can give it a little spin around the block, right? So this is um, a Merlot. It was a blending wine for centuries, and Californians discovered it as a standalone uh, grape. And it just smells so nice. It has like, like blackberries and... Like, you know, currants that you would see in scones and little cocoa in the nose. It's great. It's a, Merlot's are really soft, a little softer, less tannins than a big cab, but we will have to taste it. We just roll it around to get a little, a little air because we're not in the cork all that time. Uh, usually, uh, proprietary bottled wines have their name on the cork. Uh, this is an aggregate, which is... Um, not from a tree, so environmentally sustainable uh, aggregate product. Um, and though it's made, it looks like it's made from ground up uh, cork as opposed to the cork from the tree. Also, you see plastic corks now as well. There's a debate that the plastic cork doesn't expand and contract. Uh, cork does expand and contract and allows air to get in and, and to age the wine. Uh, good wine is always stored. You'll see the cork should always be white, wet. It shows you that they've stored the wine on the side because you want to keep the cork moist so air doesn't get in. You don't smell the cork. You squeeze it to see how moist it is and you go, hmm, 
I think they've been standing up their wine to yourself. And then, you know, you, you, when, if you go to pour wine, put your thumb over the top of the label. Don't hide the label, right? You pay all that money. Guess is sitting down. Grab it like this. Your thumb should be on the top. You want to start pouring out and then twist your wrist up. So you extend your arm and just quarter turn it and actually not dripping on the nice tablecloth. And then, of course, we'll have to taste it. What year is the wine? Someone asked, what year is the wine? 2007 was a very good year in the Russian River Valley. Well, that's great, that Merlot. I might have to have some, uh, a little taste of beef later on. Would a horseradish sauce go well with this cut? So someone asked, would a horse, horseradish sauce? You bet. Uh, you can buy the horseradish itself not horseradish cream or horseradish dressing, do they have those? By the horseradish itself in the jars, are usually put in ground up and in vinegar. Take some out, whip up some heavy cream and a little cayenne pepper and put the horseradish in with some salt. That's great, whipped horseradish dressing. Great idea, great idea. Are California wines better with age? So someone asked, are California wine is better with age. Uh, not all wines will age well. Many do. The Cabs, Cabernets, Cabernets age well. Uh, Pinot Noirs do. Merlots, Malbecs, uh, they don't necessarily age too well. The whites can age well. I've had Chablis, 98-year-old uh, Chablis, that was great. Um, I've had Pinot Noirs that were, that were 150 years old. Great tasting vinegar. I've had some Cabernets, 100 years old. Uh, they hold up, so your cabs will hold up uh, with proper storage. You need 55 degrees year-round. You need the humidity of about 65% if you're into uh, you know, story, if you want, uh, you know, wine storage temperatures. That was what you would need to have. If you can't drink yet, Chef, what do you recommend to drink with the... So if you can't drink yet um, with that, um, you know what's always nice is uh, you can have a carbonated drink. Uh, many times, you mean non-alcoholic you refer to? Uh, surprisingly enough, Dr. Pepper goes very well with this. Uh, it has a, a root, a spicy uh, note to it and goes well with the London broil. So that's what I would recommend. Avoid ice water with great tasting food. If the food's bad, drink a lot of ice water. But if it's good food, <laughs> Avoid ice water because ice water tends to deaden your palate. It freezes your taste buds. Maybe that's a good thing if you're at your great aunt's house. Or, uh, but if it's good food, you know, you shouldn't be drinking too much water. Uh, anyway, have some water to cleanse your palate in between courses. So uh, keep that in mind. So, so to wrap up today's session, it's been very exciting to have all of you here today. Take a few more questions before we sign off. But... Um, Broiling meat, great smell to it. Get that barbecue grill, the grill going. Now you can email me, Chef Mark at escafeonline.com for questions. Happy to help you out. That's what we're here for. And um, next week we'll be doing Daub de Beef à l'Ancienne, as Uncle Escafe would say, as we know it as old fashioned beef stew. That'll be next Saturday at 11 Central Daylight Time. So if there aren't any more questions, I uh, wish you a great week. Thanks for joining us. Check us out online. And happy cooking. Bye-bye. See you next time.